to meet you in person for the first time. We have mutual friends in New York, and we've been speaking about breath and hyperbaric therapy for a while, and I was very honored to be asked to speak. It's easy for me. For me, I live, well, easy for Bay Area terms is relative. It took me an hour to get here, um, but in traffic, it can take two. So um, I am a specialist in hyperbaric medicine. I am an internal medicine physician by training. And I grew up pretty alternatively, though. Um, my dad's a chiropractor, and I grew up with a very different box. In fact, there were no sides to the box that I grew up in. So I, when I went to medical school, it was really to understand how I could bring the alternative world and the conventional world together in a very high-minded 18-year-old, I guess 21-year-old way at the time. But I have found that this particular therapy has a very nice way of integrating across the allopathic or the conventional world, and also the, the alternative world, which, again, there's lots of words, words now. It used to be just alternative medicine. Now it's integrated medicine, functional medicine, holistic medicine, wellness medicine. You can I probably miss 10 of the types of medicine it could be. So it's my pleasure to be with you all today. And so I'm a doctor, and if I say doctor things that you don't understand, please let me know. Just stop me. I don't mind. You won't ruin my flow. Um, so just let me know. Raise your hand or just shout it out. I know most of you are in various professions. Are there healthcare professionals here as well? So raise your hand just so I have an idea. Okay, and those that are in um, other fields, what other fields are those? Just so I know, if you can just shout them out. Pulmonary? Pulmonary rehab or? Pulmonary medicine, okay. Are you a physician? Oh, awesome, okay. Holistic nutritionist. Nutrition, great. Anything else? Anything Fitness. Else? Fitness. Okay, awesome. Physical therapy. Physical therapy. Oh, thank you guys. Massage. I appreciate it. What's that? Massage. Massage. All right. Okay. I'm good. Next slide. <laughs> thank you for the help. Just to understand. So, I learned about hyperbaric medicine when I was back in medical school, and it was actually kind of crazy. I was in a shock trauma center. Has anybody been to Baltimore before? Nobody been to Baltimore. I've been to Baltimore. Okay. Like, Has anybody watched The Wire at least? Right? <laughs> so Baltimore is known for its shock and trauma, and a lot of, actually Army, Navy, they all go to train at shock trauma because of all the gun challenges. Inside of the basement was this gigantic submarine looking thing, and I saw some patients that were on respirators go in and walk out. And that kind of blew my mind. When I found out that it was just oxygen and pressure that was healing patients that had carbon monoxide poisoning or with flesh-eating bacteria, necrotizing fasciitis, if you've heard of that, wow. I was kind of shocked, to say the least. I hadn't thought that my sleep deprivation from my 30-hour shifts would lead to this epiphany that, but that finally I, I found a way to kind of bridge these worlds of, of as I've been discussing, alternative and conventional medicine. Because as I did more learning about hyperbaric medicine after that, I found that there was a ton of research that was going on in the US, kind of, but mostly in other countries, where hyperbaric medicine was being used in a very integrative way. It was being used with physical therapy, with massage, with, with other modalities, where it was being work, used in rehab facilities uh, to heal from strokes and traumatic brain injuries and to help people with cancer. And I was just kind of blown away, to say the least, as I've said, I think, a couple my opinion. So, and I did research and I kind of I dove in, and that's going to be a pun in a second we'll talk about, but, um, and I realized that hyperbaric therapy was really just about this. In its simple form, and I just wanted to show this to you to start, um, it's about healing wounds, and, and we're not talking about just traumatic wounds, we're talking about degenerative wounds over time, we're talking about infectious wounds over time, vascular wounds over time. All of these end processes are a wound of some sort. And what hyperbaric therapy really was doing was healing these from the inside out. And it did it no matter where they were. It didn't matter if it was in the brain or if it was in the little toe. It reversed low oxygen states. So it reversed low oxygen, or hypoxia as we call it. It decreased inflammation. Now let me ask you, is there anything that's not about inflammation? <laughs> now, it was a profound anti-inflammatory, too, just as powerful as a steroid, for example. It, fight, it fought infection, and especially infections that didn't like high oxygen environments. 
and it also causes an exponential release of stem cells. Does everybody know what stem cells are? Mm -hmm. Stem cells are the immature cells that come from either neural tissue or our bone marrow and circulate throughout our body to cause new cells and, and new uh, forms of, of tissue to form. So for example, if it's a neural stem cell, it's going to create new neurons and new supporting tissue. If it's a, if it's a bone cell, it's going to create new bone and create new bone. So, and causing an exponential release. So really, in the end, we were regenerating and revitalizing tissue. You guys with me so far? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, and the other reason why I like hyperbaric medicine, like I was, I've been kind of talking about, but to kind of throw it in real terms here, is that there are FDA-approved indications for it. So insurance covers it for these that you see here. The four that you see in purple are ones that are done in an outpatient setting, so you don't have to be in a hospital for them. And I want to show you these now, and I'm going to come back to them. But as you can see, there's 14 of them. And some of them are pretty traumatic, like the ones I mentioned before. Uh, burns will be another one that little foreshadowing are coming up in a minute. But diabetic foot ulcers, preventing amputations all the time. Delayed radiation injury, those patients that have had cancer that were treated with radiation, they often will have now remissions, but then they'll have injuries from the radiation itself which can be pretty, pretty devastating on its own. Yeah. Refractory bone infections or osteomyelitis and sudden hearing loss. But we'll talk more about that later. Next slide. This is where the fun for me is, and I think the fun for a lot of you all in, in your various professions and, and specialties. And this is why I got really excited, because I can talk out of the, the allopathic side of my mouth, which is whatever side, let's call it the right, let's call it the left side. <laughs> and I haven't thought about the sides. And, and then the right side of my mouth was this beautiful world of integrative functional medicine where hyperbaric therapy can be used synergistically and accelerate healing. And in these particular conditions, as you see here, or in particular categories, hyperbaric therapy is amazingly successful at helping the body optimize itself, healing it from the inside out. So I don't have a huge amount of time, and each of one of these categories or conditions can take an entire talk. But to give you a sense of what we can do, uh, traumatic brain injury and regenerative medicine are the ones I'm going to talk a little bit about today. But all of these are also very much in the spectrum of what we can really can help with in the chamber. Next slide. Okay, so any doctor needs to have the slide, you know, it, sir, Ralph knows this as well, that you need to have like an objective slide if you're a doctor. So uh, this is my objective slide. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly. Um, so I want to talk about what, what we're doing. What, what is hyperbaric therapy all about? And it comes from dieting. So has anybody been, uh, been scuba diving before? <laughs> we actually, can I just preface it, that Ralph has had a hyperbaric chamber in a whole entire office and is a diver as well. And Allison is, has actually put together hyperbaric chambers. Oh, she is wow. actually a hyperbaric chamber technician. Awesome. Oh, yes. Okay. So, I didn't ask if anybody had experience in that. I actually have one too. I know you well, I know you used to. Did you get another one? Uh, you might, might blew up, by the way. <laughs> so, but that's another story. That's another story. Okay, right, we'll, story. we'll get there. Okay. It wasn't so, my fault. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> so hyperbaric medicine comes from diet. It comes from treating something called decompression illness or the bends. Everybody familiar with that? The technician especially. But so when we're talking about hyperbaric medicine, this is the definition. So intermittent administration of 100% oxygen at increased atmospheric pressure. So the, ones, the words that I've underlined are most important. Intermittent mean it's not a continuous exposure over many days. The treatment itself is usually between 60 and 120 minutes, or an hour or two hours. 100% oxygen, so does anybody know how much oxygen we're breathing now? I'm sure you guys know. How much oxygen is in the air now? Anybody know? Shout it out. 21%, right? So that's at sea level. And so in the chamber, we're typically increasing that to about 100%. And then increased atmospheric pressure. So all of us know that water is heavy. If we pick up a bucket of water, it's heavy. However, if you're scuba diving, or even you're in a pool, for example, you don't feel that water because you're weightless in it. It's still exerting a significant pressure on your lungs as you are taking a breath. And so this is some term terminology that we use. One ATA is sea level. Two ATA is 33 feet of sea water. And 66 feet of sea water is three ATA. And that's just to kind of give you an, an idea of what we're going to be talking about. So, so there's a couple different types of chambers. 
The first one developed was called a multi-place chamber. Um, there, the chambers that you mostly see in hospitals, similar to the one that I saw when I was training at, at, the, at Chalk Trauma in the University of Maryland in Baltimore. These chambers can go very, very deep. They can go and treat a lot of people all at the same time. You see them all wearing masks. That's how they're getting the oxygen. So the oxygen is within the mask itself. And these particular chambers are from a place called the Sagal Center for Hyperbaric Medicine in Tel Aviv, Israel. They are the largest hyperbaric facility in the world. And I was just visiting them earlier this year in February. They're treating 200 patients a day. Most of these patients are on their reverse aging and rejuvenation protocols. And we'll talk more about that later. But they're phenomenally successful. And the reason for that, uh, there are many, many reasons for that. But they're doing the research. They're the guys that are doing all the research that's showing how powerful hyperbaric therapy is for what it can do, which, which is coming. Next, next slide. Thanks. Here we go. Okay. Does anyone recognize who's in my chamber there? Is it MJ? Press the next one. So it comes out. Everybody, what? Yeah. Everybody, what? Everybody, what? So, yeah. all right, so that's my favorite part of Jackson's song. Um, the first 50% of people, so 50% of people that come and speak to me about hyperbaric therapy, I'd say about 50%. The first question they ask me is, isn't that what Michael Jackson used? Has anybody heard of Michael Jackson using hyperbaric therapy? Yeah. Okay, so, um, that's also my favorite Michael Jackson song, Black and White, 1992. You feel it? <laughs> so, monoplace chambers were developed after the multiplace. These are single person chambers. They don't go down as deep, but they still have a lot of therapeutic value. And the more modern ones are the one here on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, they're prettier, uh, all translucent, although some of them look like some Marines too. And you have TV uh, that you can watch while you're in there, although I don't recommend that, and we'll talk more about that. Next slide. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. And then soft chambers are the ones that have developed most recently. These are the, what we call mild hyperbaric therapy. And mild hyperbaric therapy, you don't go down as deep in pressure, about 1.3 atmospheres. And they're pressurized with air. And like we talked about, air pressure, 21% oxygen versus 100% oxygen. You can also get extra oxygen in there with a nasal cannula. And that can also be very helpful. These chambers are really good for neuro neurocognitive optimization. They're also good for, I think, some of the breath work that you're learning about, and also for recovery from injury, recovery from workouts, etc. We'll talk more about that too. Next. So the experience of going into a chamber, uh, it's, it, I like dogs. I used to have dogs, and I miss having them. And my dogs have always had big ears. And, and this is a good dis description of what you feel like when you're in a chamber. If you scuba dive before, if you've been in a pool, you go down deep. Anybody free dive, by the way? Awesome. All right. Um, I've never free dived, but it's, it's all the same thing. You're going to feel this ear pressure when you go up in altitude or you go down in altitude, down in sea level. Uh, and so that's what you feel when you're going down to your pressure. When you get down to the pressure, you no longer have that feeling. You just relax. You're just relaxing and you just you do what you're supposed to do, which is many things, depending on the person. While you're there, you're there, and then you come back up, and you come back up to sea level, you still have that same feeling in your ears. I often think about this evolutionarily. It's more difficult to go down in pressure than it is to go up. My thought here is that uh, whoever created us, evolution, etc., didn't want us to go down deep, and so made it difficult for our ears to get down there. But if we need to get up fast and not die, it didn't want us to have so much trouble with our ears on the way up. So, evolutionarily, easier to go up than down. Just so you know. Next. Yeah. Keep going. You don't want to see this one. <laughs> okay, so, have you talked about oxygen carrying capacity yet? Not as much yeah. as we'd like you to. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so, I don't want to tell anything that you don't already know. Just to say that we already talked about sea level air only having 21% oxygen in it. In the chamber, we're increasing that to 100% most of the time. Now, Oxygen carrying capacity is usually reliant on the number of red blood cells that we have in our body. Now, most of us in the classic group would say <clears throat> that you can't oxygenate anymore because your oxygen levels are 97%. If you put somebody on a, on a pulse ox, for example, yeah. everybody know what a pulse ox is? Yes. You put it on your finger, you measure how much oxygen. Bed. Okay, great. Okay. So that's the number of red blood cell sites for oxygen that are bound. 
most of us that don't require extra oxygen will have somewhere between 95 and 100% of those sites already down. I'm putting aside breath work for a minute. Okay. And so the only way really to increase the amount of oxygen carrying capacity classically is to increase the number of our blood cells. And so there's a couple ways to do that. You can train at altitude. If you train at altitude, more red blood cells get produced. You can do some of the illegal stuff that Lance and others have done, which is give yourself more red blood cells before a race. Or you can give yourself a drug called epigen to increase the number of red blood cells in circulation. Hyperbaric therapy doesn't work that way. It works by saturating the plasma of your blood, which is the liquid of your blood. Next. An entirely different way of saturating and increasing oxygen carrying capacity. This, this is a little bit of physics, but not much. Henry's law states that the more pressure you put on a gas, the more of that gas goes from liquid, so it goes from gas to liquid, okay? And the opposite is also true, uh, as you can imagine. So we are driving oxygen into the body by pressurizing. You can't just get more oxygen in the body by putting 100% face mask on, unless you're doing some of the work that you will be learning or are learning now about recruiting more lung capacity. And so classically, the only way that you can really get more oxygen in circulation is by pressurizing. That's why just the face mask won't work for patients. I get that question a lot. Why can't I just wear a face mask? And, the physio and I have a lung physiologist that could tell me a lot more. But on the next slide, he's going to laugh at me. Go ahead. OK. Um, all I really want to do with this slide is point out the last two, really, um, in the sense that when we're driving more oxygen in the body, we are the oxygen tissue tension goes from 55 millimeters, millimeters of mercury all the way up to 500. So that's a significant increase. And then at 3 ATA, which is 66 feet of seawater, they've done studies on animals, not on humans, but sort of by way of, you don't need to have any red blood cells at all to have all your physiologic functions taken care of if you're a rabbit or a mouse. And they use this therapeutically in the chambers in trauma centers to treat patients with severe anemia, for example especially Jehovah's Witnesses that don't want transfusions. So this is a way to temporize them before, before their body starts recovering some of that blood that they don't want you know, exogenously or, or giving them to them. So it's a pretty powerful, pretty powerful stimulus. So um, my note on breath, you can go to the next. So you all probably know this. Um, when we hyperventilate, we breathe off CO2. That makes our body more alkaline or more uh, we call it alkalosis in medicine. And that causes a vasoconstriction to happen. And that's evolutionarily good. If you have a cut, you want to vasoconstrict that vessel, make it smaller so it stops bleeding. That's what happens naturally with all of us. But over time, as we all know, hyperventilation ain't cool. And it also makes this dissociation curve, so basically more oxygen. So typically red blood cells carry oxygen to the body, release the oxygen to the tissue. But if, it's, if you're hyperventilating, less of that oxygen gets, uh, gets taken off the right blood cell, causing more damage. Yes. Acidosis is the opposite. So we don't breathe. And the, the CO2 builds up. And there's evolutionary reasons why we dilate our blood vessels instead of constrict them. But again, this is not a good thing over time either. Um, the dissociation curve, so more oxygen does get delivered, but then there's less reserve for you as well. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. I should, at least we're taking a picture, so I don't want to do this. Okay. And so, in a hyperbaric chamber, simply we can overcome poor breathing patterns in the short term because we're massively oxygenating the body. However, if you combine these two, the immediate effects can be dramatic because all of a sudden, not only are you recruiting more lung tissue, oxygenating some of those red blood cells, but you're also oxygenating more plasma at the same time. So there you have this massive increase in oxygen carrying capacity. And I haven't seen this in physiological studies because nobody's doing that. But I've seen it in patients in front of me. I know I know this has as well. Just the massive increase in capacity you will get almost immediately, especially in the low pressure chambers, which are a lot more accessible for patients. Okay, keep going. The power. All right. Keep, so you might just want to click the button a bunch. And then Oh, no. All right, good. So, um, so the immediate effects of going into a chamber are as follows. So we, it also decreases the size of blood vessels, which is a good thing if you have a trauma to a blood vessel. Because if you have a trauma to a blood vessel, 
you know, it's all leaking out, bad stuff getting in the tissues, causing lots of inflammation. You don't want that. You want the blood vessel to, to clamp down. The positive is, though, is that you've saturated so much oxygen into the plasma that you're still net getting a lot more oxygen to that tissue. And as a result, you're preserving tissue. So if you imagine, if you have, I gotta stay here for a minute. If you imagine that you have a blockage in a blood vessel, so downstream of that, all that tissue is not getting any blood, and then they're not getting any oxygen. Like, oh shit, that's all gonna go. But if you have more oxygen diffused into the plasma, more oxygen is gonna diffuse around that and save a lot of that tissue. We talk about it in micron depth, which is, I don't really, you know, it's a hard thing to construct, but just say typical oxygenation goes about 64 microns into tissue from a blood vessel. We can get 164 in a chamber. So, you know, every little micron matters, right? I never said that before. <laughs> but I, I often say that, you know, we, in, in the medical community we say, you know, time is brain, you know, time is heart. You, know, you need to get revascularized, get that vessel open. So time is, is hyperbaric medicine too. The faster you can get somebody into a chamber, the more uh, tissue that you're going to save. And that's that's pretty dramatic, as you can imagine. It also immediately decreases it. Sorry. It also immediately sorry, sorry. It, it also immediately decreases inflammation and pain, like immediately. And there's no long process that's required for that, which is pretty significant. There's an exponential release of stem cells, like I was discussing. The immune system gets revved up, starts functioning better. It kills bugs, especially bugs that don't like high oxygen environments. Examples, MRSA, anybody heard of MRSA? Okay, bad bug. Very, very powerful in the chamber. Um, some of the necrotizing fasciitis bugs, like Clostridium bugs, others, but gas-forming organisms, they don't like high oxygen environments. And there's others, but the ones in your mouth, for example, those are common ones. Also, the ones that overgrow in your gut, uh, those tend to be uh, oxygen-poor uh, organisms, so they don't like high oxygen environments. And I think important for all of you to, is, is massively improve detoxification and lymphatic flow. And it's doing that by the pressure, actually, on the cells and on the blood vessels and on the lymphatics. So this is all pressure sensitive, so you're pressurizing these and your body is now detoxing. So it's important you have the right detox pathways and everything else medically to, to make this work. Yeah. And that's why working in an integrated context is really, really helpful. Um, and then the mitochondria are the batteries of our cells. The, they make energy. And we're just revving up the whole process. This is, and this is a, um, an image of a blood vessel that's narrowed or red blood cells aren't getting through. But you can see how oxygen is still getting past it. And, and helping preserve that tissue instead of all of it dying. Next slide. Oh. Like that, I was like, like that. <laughs> okay. All right, and so a protocol of hyperbaric therapy is usually more than one treatment. These treatments are actually working not only on the acute physiology that we just spoke about, but actually on the DNA. And that's kind of amazing. It's, it's increasing, it's, it's causing an expression of certain genes and a suppression of others. And expressing genes that are responsible for growth and and decreasing inflammation, and depressing or suppressing genes that are responsible uh, for things like inflammation and cells dying. And so all you're seeing here and all of this really is just that growth pattern that's happening. I'm gonna start from the bottom up actually here and just say that new blood vessel growth is such a huge, huge issue because what's happening over time in all of us is that our blood vessels are deteriorating. As we get older, it's just what happens unless Maybe you work on your breath and other integrated things. But um, you see that a lot in the frontal lobe, in the, in, the, in the front of your brain, and in some place called the hippocampus, which is where we store our memory. And hyperbaric therapy can actually increase blood vascularization by making new blood vessels in these areas. And it's dramatic, we can, and I'll show you some pictures of this in a minute. We talked about stem cell release already. Uh, we talked about inflammation. Those are some of the factors, if you care. And the other thing to mention also is just there's also a significant antioxidant response that happens in the chamber. And does anybody, I don't know if I should go into this too, too much or not, but oxidative stress versus the antioxidant response, does this all sound familiar to you? Is this like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. What do you guys think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the brief of it is that oxidative stress, so our body works with these things called free radicals. And free radicals form for good reason. They help with enzymes, they help with detoxification. Um, oxygen is a free radical in the way it's used in our body to help with energy formation. But when oxidation, 
is too high, it makes the body break down. Hyperbaric therapy works by causing an oxidative stress, more oxygen to the body. That helps with all these DNA changes that I'm talking about. Then the body, what happens is it has this reactive antioxidant response to the oxidative stress. However, if you already are under a lot of oxidative stress, you have a lot of autoimmune disease, you have chronic inflammatory problems, it could be a problem. And you have to, and that's why integrative, an integrative mindset is really important in this capacity. I hope that made sense. Okay. All right, next, next slide. This is just a, a diagram showing new blood vessels forming around an area that's either stenotic or where, where blood vessels can't get through or red blood cells can't get through. And this is, this is beautiful. You can think about this anywhere. You can think about this in your brain. You can think about this in your heart. You can think about this in a limb. Um, anywhere. Next. So I like to think of hyperbaric therapy as like this beautiful scaffold builder. Because one treatment is going to optimize your physiologic response, but a, tr a protocol is going to rebuild the scaffolding of your tissue. It's going to create new connective tissue, new bone, new cartilage, new supporting cells in the brain, uh, new neurons even, uh, repurposing other neurons, and then also creating the blood vessels in that tissue that's going to make it sustainable over the long term. So not just you go into the gym to get better, then you go back to the way you were. Although that does happen if you don't change some other stuff. Honestly, it just takes longer, right? So for example, and we'll talk more about this, but if, if you have the generation of blood vessels, there's probably a reason for that, right? It's probably because you're not breathing right, or that you're eating shitty foods. So cursing is okay. Um, okay. Did you curse? Okay, good. My sailor? Okay, okay, good. All right. Okay, I shouldn't ask ahead of time. So anyway, good. So, the other, I think, underappreciated part of being in a chamber is anybody know what a float tank is? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, does anybody, has everybody been in a float tank? Yeah. yeah. Oh, beautiful, right. I have, I have a treatment in my mind, I'm excited. Um, <laughs> hyperbaric therapy can act like a pressurized float tank. If you want it to, if you choose to, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you've ever seen this before, but maybe you have, but uh, I often will have patients put a face mask on in the chamber. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have a float tank that's pressurized and you have increased cognitive capacity at the same time because you're oxygenating the brain. And so you can do a lot for people and have them have experiences when they're cut off from the outside world. And I, I can tell you a story of just a lady that I, that I treated recently uh, in New York actually. And she's on TV from 5 a.m. till 10 a.m. every morning, sports show. Type A, like crazy, like beautifully amazing person she got into the chamber, she freaked out because her phone was gone, she had no, has anybody had this experience or no patients that have had this experience, right? Where you, like all of a sudden, like, oh my God. But 10 minutes later, it was like the most zen she had ever felt because she was oxygenated, she was fine, she was breathing. You even know who this is, okay. Uh, because she was doing some of your work. I forgot that that's yeah. <laughs> you know, you know who I'm talking about and, and how type A she is. And so it was a beautiful response to see. And I see that a lot, actually. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, you just click like one more. Yeah, so just a brief primer on protocols. We're not going to get into this now. We talked about the three chambers. Uh, we talked about how hyperbaric therapy is a certain amount of time. Treatments depend on what we're looking to do. Next slide. Keep it going. All right. So this is my approach, and I think this is why Lisa and I get along so well, is that we know that it's not just, you know, it's not the magic pill, right? It's not the magic thing that's going to be helpful for you. You have to meet people where they are. And even, so I'm an integrative hyperbaric physician, but when patients talk to me, it's like, yeah, hyperbaric medicine, that, that's true, but what about all these other things that you need to do to optimize you so that you really have the best result? I mean, what I often see is that patients will get better in the chamber if they have chronic issues, but over time they'll get worse again if they haven't done a lot of these other things. And so this is my approach. Health Optimization Medicine is another program that I, I work on. It's a cellular energy program. It's one that looks at basic foundational health. And then, of course, have, have you all heard of functional medicine before? Yeah. Does anybody see a functional medicine doctor? Or Okay, so you guys, of course, I'm actually talking about something. There you go. Like next door. Um, but functional medicine is beautiful. It looks at things from an underlying disease management perspective. What's causing the illness? 
that expert referral, that's where all of you come in. Massage therapists, lymphatic specialists, uh, PT, uh, breath, I mean, I can go on and on. But I have psychiatrists, psychologists, cannabis experts, uh, jungle experts in Peru, and you have, you know, I know them all. And, and I'm, so, I'm so privileged and grateful that I do. And I love meeting people where they are, and they're like, yeah, I want to go to the jungle. I'm like, sure, but with that guy, right? But, or if like, I don't want to walk around the block, Okay, let's uh, let's start with something easy, like a psychologist or something. You know, um, you know, like it depends on where they are. <laughs> um, but technology is super a lot of fun. In fact, I kind of one of my forays into this world started with performance technology, things like neurofeedback, also electromagnetic field technologies, you know, saunas, cold thermogenesis, all that kind of stuff. You guys all like that stuff? Have fun with that stuff. Okay. Those can be conversations in the moment, in their own right. But hyperbaric therapy, like I said, is a part of my, is, is a main part of what I do. But this whole approach is really the key. Right? And then I, I've spoken about this a little bit already. The movement and breath work in the chamber are so powerful. So powerful. Okay, okay, next. Okay, this is, uh, this is my mentor and the founder of this, uh, this program called Health Optimization Medicine. Dr. Ted is one of those brilliant guys that knows everything about everything. And um, but is very humble and created this program that I'm the chief operating officer for where we're creating coursework for doctors, uh, coursework for practitioners, and eventually coaches and other allied healthcare professionals to learn a new way of practicing health, not disease. So we don't talk about disease at all. Uh, and I don't mean this to be a pitch other than to say, like, I think it's the foundation of all health, which is cellular health. and. Um, this is a part of my approach. And so when I have somebody come to my office, since I started doing this, it's, it's been game changing. Um, we, look, we took, it, we took we, I think a very measured approach looking at quantified data, looking at quantified testing, and not just saying, here's some antioxidants, here's some B vitamins, and here's some other stuff to take. It's really like, you have a deficiency in this, you need this. How many people take supplements? How many people know why they take supplements? Okay, but uh, do you know why in the sense of you think you need this, or have you had measured results that say, this is what I need? The latter? Yeah. Awesome. Well done. So that's uncommon, right? And most of your patients are going to have the, the, you guys are better than most people. <laughs> like, I, for the most part, I have. It's a master class. It's master class. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I love it, because most of the time I have this conversation, yeah, like I, I had this, I saw this on TV, or, you know, my doctor said I should take more antioxidants or something, right? We know like too many antioxidants are bad, yeah. right? Because you're going to downregulate your own body's natural antioxidant production. So, anyway, so the quantified approach is the, I think, the real approach. So next, so we talked about this before. I wanted to throw them up here now. I don't really want to talk about them very much uh, unless you guys have any questions about these specifically. Um, powerful stuff, vastly underutilized. These are all covered by insurance. So I have Medicare patients that come in, commercial insurance patients. Um, unfortunately, our system is not set up for these patients to come see me. These patients are usually intervened on in other ways beforehand. Amputations, cystoscopies with radioablations, which basically means laser therapies for bladders that are bleeding, etc. So, anyway, off to the next slide. Let's get happier. Okay, so, um, on the investigational side, I'm going to speak about traumatic brain injury and regenerative medicine. But hyperbaric therapy is also a stimulator of wound healing, as I, as I spoke about. So anybody that gets surgery, whether it's a nose job, or a hip replacement, an ACL tear, an athlete, you're going to allow them to heal about 50% faster. That's pretty dramatic. Yes. You're going to heal anyway. So insurance is never going to cover it. However, if you want to heal faster and you have the means, because this is going to be a cash price for somebody. And I have a lot of the elite athletes. I have an NFL football player now. We've done you know, tons of NFL players and MLB, Tommy John surgeries, etc. Like, these guys, they pay for every day they're not playing. They're losing millions of dollars. It's a big deal. So but even weekend warriors and even uh, your, your housewife that doesn't want to have their nose job. You know, that looks all raccoon guys for an extra week. I mean, it's, that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, it works. And so, patients post-stroke, we have significant data to support the use of hyperbaric therapy to help stroke recovery. 
uh, in synergy with cancer. It's a big topic itself, but hyperbaric therapy in combination with other cancer treatments looking very, very promising. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, and also colitis. If you guys have friends or maybe yourself you know people with Crohn's, it's a, it's a devastating disease and, or condition. Hyperbaric therapy can be really powerful, put people into remission. Refractory from medications, it's pretty amazing. And chronic fatigue syndrome is a very big box in itself, depending on what you believe chronic fatigue syndrome is. However, hyperbaric therapy in combination with other integrative modalities can be very effective. We'll talk about all these for an hour or more. But I'm gonna let you guys like just think about this slide for a minute, for not even five seconds, and then at the end we can you can ask questions. Well you can ask questions in the How much is this a treatment if you're paying for it by yourself? It depends on where you get it. Yeah. In the Bay Area, what's up? I guess what's a real Yeah, so for a soft chamber you're gonna see anywhere between seventy five and one hundred and fifty dollars a session. For a hard chamber, which are they're more versatile, they can go to deeper pressures, and depends on what you're using them for, like about uh, anywhere between 150 and $450 a session. You can probably tell or guess where it's more expensive. Yeah. And uh, in New York, for example. Okay, next. So, this is a very important slide. The brain normally is consuming a ton of oxygen. And only 5% of the neurons at any one time are actually active. It's interesting, we always think about we're always using 100% of our brain or whatever. We kind of are and aren't at the same time, and this is done evolutionarily for a reason. It's uh, the body has to use oxygen and use neural tissue when it needs to and hold that capacity. Um, but it doesn't have a huge amount of capacity left to heal injuries that you may get, strokes, traumatic brain injuries. That's a big deal. Thanks. So when I talk about hyperbaric medicine in the setting of traumatic brain injury and stroke, I like to think about a still lake early in the morning with no wind, it's completely flat, there are no waves. You throw a rock into it, it's a direct impact. Around that direct impact is a bunch of ripples. In a traumatic brain injury, for example, there's probably a bunch of pebbles. Okay, and those pebbles don't have a huge amount of impact, but there's lots of ripples. In a stroke, there's a gigantic impact and then around that is a gigantic amount of ripple, but just one area. So you can think about that as sort of dead tissue versus tissue that has been injured in a brain, okay? Dead tissue is the impact, not coming back. It's not coming back. But the rest of that, in a much higher percentage versus the impact, is the ripple area. The ripple area has the potential to regenerate if given the right nutrients from the body, oxygen being the biggest. Now, there's lots of other nutrients that are necessary, but if you don't have oxygen, no, nothing else is gonna work. And so, acutely, like we talked about, you have an acute injury, you dramatically increase the amount of oxygen in circulation, you prevent some of that area in the ripple from dying. Um, and in, in the long term, if somebody comes three, six months, years later, some of this tissue can still regenerate even many years later, and I've seen it. Next. And so this is a picture of a brain, it's called the spec scan. Has anybody heard of a spec scan before? So it's, it's an image that looks a little bit differently. So you have MRIs and CAT scans that look at anatomy of the brain. This is actually looking at the, the blood flow of the brain. Um, and looking at how blood is flowing in particular uh, areas of the brain. Can you just click one more time? So around, I want to show you this. So um, white is really, really high blood flow areas, okay? And the further you go down, like so the black is no blood flow, okay? So here, look at the parietal part of your brain, the top of your brain in this patient. You see how the top is green and yellow? But if you look down the next one, almost all of that is gone, okay? And then in addition, all the white that's popped up in the frontal lobe and in the temporal lobe over here. And then internally, if you look back on the other one, that's all the way to the left, um, you can see the increase in oxygenation. It's not as easy to see there. That's why I like this picture to show. Don't worry about the bottom slide. Just Focus on those, those are pretty. <laughs> okay. All right, this is a fun area. Um, again, it's an own topic, but this is the only skin I show, okay? Foreshadowing, the only skin I show <laughs> in, uh, in this, in this uh, presentation. But, so the Israelis really are at the, the forefront of hyperbaric medicine, and so I was alluding to the 200 patients a day getting treated in Israel. So what they're doing is they're doing diagnostics on all these patients first. They're doing VO2 max testing. Anybody done that before? Not fun, not fun. 
being hooked up to it. But, but it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very, um, something that's easily done and you can, the results are very, what's the word? They're repeatable over time. So that's why they do it. They do VO2 max testing, they do neurocognitive testing, they do brain MRI testing. They do this before. They also do heart testing, they're looking at the heart on an MRI. And they're also doing sexual organ testing, like the penis as well. Looking at blood flow before, and looking at blood flow afterwards. That's why they have a 20,000 person mailing list. <laughs> the penises, which I'll show you. It's not mine. That's why I like to say it. Not mine. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so they're doing this, and they're giving these people their pictures. Like, here is your brain after 40 treatments of hyperbaric therapy, for 60 treatments. Here is your heart. Here is your penis. And then they show them to their friends, and. <laughs> that was crazy. Anyway, so, uh, next to back, back, back. Sure. So, uh, that's kind of an overview. Hyperbaric therapy in sports injury, we've talked about. Hyperbaric therapy is going to synergize with the body, allow it to heal faster, so heal from injury. Cognitive enhancement for increased amount of blood flow to the brain. Again, synergistically with lots of other technologies, including breath, of course. But we know that from studies that the brain is actually the reason, it, the, the rate limiting step is oxygen. So as soon as you have more oxygen in the brain, you can think better. And we can actually do studies in the chamber to show that. This is one here, looking at multitasking ability inside a hyperbaric chamber, interestingly enough. This other, this other study here, looking at uh, cognitive enhancement in healthy adults, this is in China. They had college, or I guess, tests, just five hyperbaric treatments, and then they put them in a scanner before and afterwards, looking at some functional imaging or blood flow. And their brains lit up in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, not surprising you guys just saw. Their memories got better, their attention span got better, their ability to take things from long-term memory to short-term memory got better. And I guess in China, like in a lot of, I think in India it's very similar, there's like a huge amount of competition for like two schools in the entire country, like with billions of people. So anyway, these things are very important and, and hyperbaric therapy is actually very prominently used for these kinds of indications. In the cardiovascular fitness arena, this is huge. Um, I talked already about the increase in oxygen carrying capacity, right? So hypothetically, you can go into a chamber, come out and do your race, and you have all that saturated oxygen in your plasma for about an hour, about an hour and a half. On the back end, after about 40, after at least 20, but at least, but also 40 and 60 treatments, you're going to recreate, you're going to recreate new blood vessels around your heart. You're going to be more vascular. So you have the ability to oxygenate your heart better. So instead of that lactate building up, you don't have that lactate threshold. So your endurance goes up. And then correspondingly, your, your recovery also goes up too, because we're helping with the detox part. We talked about the lymphatic flow, the pressure. It's huge. You guys excited? I'm excited. Yeah. I was yes. excited about that. That's awesome. Yeah. Next. Yeah, this is my brain. Okay. Uh, I went there, they did a, uh, it's called a functional MRI of my brain, looking at blood flow. And I had a normal blood flow of my brain, thankfully, because I've had concussions in the past. Uh, but what you can see is, I mean, rudimentarily, 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 you can see that, like, if there's asymmetries, there might be blood flow problems. There's another image that goes along with this that actually looks at the, the neuron pathways itself. So not only looking at blood flow, but actually looking at the fibers, you can see where things have, have gotten screwed up over time. Super cool. Next. This is, what, this is a penis, this is not mine. Uh, this is a study that they just published looking at erectile dysfunction. Now, it's not the greatest picture of a penis, of course, but you're looking at hyperbaric therapies, improvements in blood flow, improving erections in, in patients with erectile dysfunction. And so, that's the selling point, right? <laughs> that's what it comes down to. And like I was speaking about before, we're recreating new blood vessels in the brain, in the heart, in the penis, in, in other organs, in other areas of the body. And so this is why it's a wound healer. This is why it's a physiologic optimizer. And that's why it can be used to accelerate and to synergize with lots of other modalities. Yes. Okay, how much time do I have? I don't know what I'm going to do. To speak? Yeah. You have 47 minutes in, in this <coughs> presentation already. So. I made it 47 minutes. Yes. Okay, I need to finish. That's what I thought. Keep going. Oxidative stress I already talked about. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, one back. One back. 
<laughs> so just to say, and I mentioned this earlier, if patients have lots of oxidative stress ongoing, lots of inflammation, lots of chronic fill in the blank, it's good to test for their antioxidant levels if you can. If you can't, a lot of times they will give antioxidants just a little bit to help tolerate therapy. Mm. Uh, because what can happen is if you give somebody, especially the deeper pressure, so if the soft chamber is mild pressures, I'm not as worried about it, but the deeper pressures, I can cause people to have severe symptoms, gut symptoms like you know, GI problems, diarrhea, vomiting, massive fatigue, like it can be nasty, especially in patients that have infections. So I'm cognizant of this, and I know that police and others are cognizant that you have to know, you know what's happening before you get somebody in the chamber. Um, next, uh, oh, these are some side effects that can happen, they're very rare. Um, the ear is the biggest one, like we talked about. If you don't tell somebody you're having ear trouble, you can pop your eardrum in the chamber. It's just a hole in the eardrum. It heals. But anyway, <laughs> it's very, very rare to happen. Very rare. And some of this other stuff is very, very rare. Um, toxicity, rare toxicity to the brain and the lungs, if you have abnormal lungs, or if you have an abnormal brain in some way. Um, usually, if you have an underlying seizure disorder. So next. Um, the only reason you can't get into a chamber is if you have a pneumothorax. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Basically, you have a drop lung that doesn't have any air in it, and that's just something that you should go to a hospital for. <laughs> so, anyway, so, but other than that, everything else is, there's gray area. But in general, we don't like people that require oxygen to go into ox to oxygen enriched environments, because they have a different stimulus to breathe. You probably know this already, than you or I. So, some other things to worry about, to think about. But again, the other thing I talk about is hyperbaric therapy is safer than Tylenol. Does anybody still take Tylenol? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. I didn't have to go on that soapbox. Next. Okay, so that, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to go back and, and just give you this as my thank you. That's good. All right. Hyperbaric therapy really is the ultimate accelerator and synergizer. In and of itself, it's going to be a massive oxygen stimulus and a massive physiologic optimizer. But if you don't have all those other pieces, if you don't work on detox, you don't work on movement, you don't work on breath, you don't work on optimizing cellular health, a lot of times whatever you see is going just to be a glimpse of what they could be. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes I go, okay, let's get you in the chamber, you don't want to do anything else, okay. And they're like, wow, I feel so much better. It's probably happened a couple times to some of you. And that they're around hyperbaric medicine. I go, okay, good. It's not going to happen again until you do better. It may after 40 treatments, but even if we get you back there, I can't promise you it's going to stay. You may go, well, I can feel this, better, this much better. And then you start having them die <coughs> deeper, you know, no pun again. But in the sense of, <laughs> I do that all the time, I don't mean. Um, but you know how it is with patients that they need to start feeling better before they really want to take that next step. And so sometimes I use the chamber simply for that. And I think that's what you use in the chamber for a lot as well, Lisa, in your office, is that you say, this is how you could feel. Do you want to feel this way? Simple. And then it's usually not much of a question for them until, now you've opened it up. Now you're like, now, now they're more open to you. And, and to some of the other crazy things you might want them to do or ask them to consider. And that's when it becomes really beautiful. So, next. Next one. Oh, one more slide. Right. There's one more. There's one more. Yeah, and so, um, this is a silly quote, but this is you know, two of the people that I, I, I value a lot. But I like to also say without oxygen, neither of what they say is possible, because we wouldn't be speaking here in front of us, but um, in front of you. I wouldn't speak here. Um, so, imagination is more important than knowledge. I completely agree with that. Um, curiosity, however, is also more important than imagination in my mind. And so, thank you for listening. I know this is a, probably out of your box to talk about what we spoke about today to some degree. Um, I hope that I made it accessible to you, and now I'm going to open it up for any questions you might have. Hi. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm going to stand up for a second, you're like stretch, you know? You guys just ate, so I don't know. <laughs> Do you remember the video of this song? Wow. It's like on a, it's not a bus, right? It's like back and forth like this. Right? Okay. Alright. Thank you. Alright. Okay.
Yes, questions? Uh, two reasons, yes. I was just curious about, because you didn't mention cerebral spinal fluid, so it would mm -hmm. have the same effect just yes. in the pump, the, the yeah. pump stat. Thank you for, yes, I forgot to mention cerebral spinal fluid. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I know this is probably individualized and has to do with all the other things that you're doing, but let's say you have an athlete who has a, an event or a race and you want to have them optimal, but you want to have it so that they've had all the adaptations, vascular adaptations and performance adaptations, mm -hmm. not just go in the chamber and then go race the next day or whatever. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's difficult to pull up. Okay, yeah. so yeah. how long before that big event do you want to start therapy and how frequently mm -hmm. would you go so that the adaptations are, are available all throughout training, but then on that day? It's a beautiful question, and I have a couple trainers that I work with specifically on this point. Ideally, if you can, you want to get them through a 40 or 60 block treatment of hyperbaric therapy. So getting all the physiologic benefits way ahead of time, like yeah. three months, six months before their real training starts. Yeah. Make sense? Because then you have all that capacity that you've built up. Then, while they're getting they're, while they're kind of really ramping up and doing those, say, three months or something of high-intensity training, then you use hyperbaric therapy as a detox lymphatic pump to help with recovery and to help with you know, physiologic optimization. Once you change your DNA in a hyperbaric chamber, you've changed it. So your body utilizes oxygen better in the post-treatment period, even outside of all of the stuff that we've talked about. So you have all the benefits. Now, that's not ideal for everybody, of course. So my, my, my sort of minimal viable product in this case, I'm in Silicon Valley, I, I talk about this too. <laughs> but the so MVP for me is 20 treatments. Because 20 is, I know, where 20 high barrier treatments. And, and a deeper pressure, not at the soft chambers, not at the deeper pressures. For the endurance athletes, for those that really want the maximal you know, angiogenesis, new blood vessel flow, stem cell release, all that happens at the deeper pressures. Now you can get neuro stem, neuro stem cells released at the, at the more superficial pressures and the soft chambers, but it's different. It's different. So I mean, if you have a chest player, you know, and you're yeah. optimizing for a chest player, then that would work. But, you know. So twenty treatments. Yeah, twenty is usually my minimum. Like once a week. No, and so that's I, I don't maybe I didn't make that completely clear. It's a successive day treatment therapy. So it's Monday through Friday with the weekends off for a block. You can do it for six days a week, um, but it, it should be done successively. And the reason for so that one a day, one per day, five days, then two days off, then five days, five treatments. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And the reason for that is that when you're affecting something, oxygen is affecting the DNA. It's a cumulative process of oxidative stress that's happening. Yeah. Okay, now, if you're, if you're using the recovery, only like two weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. So four four weeks. weeks. Five yeah. weeks. Yeah. It's okay. Four, four weeks. weeks. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. I can't do nothing. But um, <laughs> so yes, yeah, just 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 four weeks. Yeah, just four weeks. So would you say, okay, that, so that four weeks should happen, um, and then you kind of do your, your training, and then you go into a detox? So yes, yeah, so I would say that you do your, your, your training during the, the, the 20, that's fine. But you'd like to do it earlier, if possible, then you're really getting down and doing your really hard training before you know, your race or whatever it is. Then once you finish the 20, then you use hyperbaric therapy sort of as needed. You don't have to use it every day. You can use it after hard workouts. You can use it every day. You can even use the soft chambers, actually. You don't even need the hard chambers as much. You just need that detox. You need that. It helps with the lymphatic and the blood flow and the spinal fluid, helping with the detox part of it. And it's going to help with the physiology part of it to some degree. But once you've had that deep pressure for the 20 block, I've seen patients and athletes do really, really well. Now, if they can do more, it's better. but. I know that life is not an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. this question. We have uh, yeah. four more minutes. Okay. Okay. Oh, just an observation. Yes. Back to Michael Jackson. Uh, he was doing this uh, Pepsi commission. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there was a fire and he got burnt. And as you were showing, the parties were both things he was going to bear for. And so he was taken across the street to Michael Berry Center. You know what? He went on staff. You were on staff? Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, he improved the rest of his, his, his 
Yeah. yeah. And he got a chamber for his house. And then he donated the chamber back to the Children's Hospital in LA. And that's where you saw the pictures. I meant to mention that. Thank you. So we're gonna we have to actually wrap it up because um, we have to move on to the next thing. So hang on to your questions. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of research online about this, and we have Scott not like definitely as a resource, but we have him as a resource. We also have a lot of articles that we're going to be handing out as well. So um, and again, we've had him here for a whole chunk of time, and you're on. You just had a new baby, right? A year ago. He's a year. He's a year already. Oh, but there's more than one. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> You want to borrow one and answer? <laughs> <laughs> I should have brought one. They're about school now, so they're two months later. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much.